Thank you very much. The next item of business is Members' Business Debate on Motion 7970 in the name of Ivan McKee on the day of the imprisoned writer. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Ivan McKee to open the debate for around seven minutes, please, Mr McKee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to be able to hold this debate today to commemorate the day of the imprisoned writer, which falls annually on the 15th of November. I'm grateful to Scottish Pen and Amnesty International for their support in organising this debate and welcome the members of both organisations who are present in the gallery this afternoon. Around the world, writers find themselves imprisoned or worse for doing no more than putting pen to paper. There are so many that so many are persecuted for this simple act in the 21st century is something that should concern us all. Last week I attended and spoke briefly at the evening reception organised in the Parliament by Michael Russell, MSP, Scottish Pen and Amnesty. Works from writers from around the world were read out from a range of countries. The works themselves and the stories that lay behind them were harrowing, yet inspirational, painful and powerful, a reminder of the power of words to move us. And those who read the works on behalf of imprisoned writers who could not be there often had direct experience themselves of the inside of prison cells. Many of the speakers in this debate today will highlight the story of a particular writer imprisoned somewhere in the world just now, the diversity of geography, language, culture and beliefs that will be represented today indicates the worrying scale of the problem, the commonality of the suffering that lies behind the tales, but also the universality of the human spirit that drives writers to continue to put pen to paper, to speak truth unto power, despite the magnitude of the consequences that may ensue. The 2017 World Press Freedom Index, compiled by Reporters Without Borders, noted a significant decline in press freedom, as the situation had worsened in nearly two-thirds of the 180 countries in the index. In 2016, according to RSF, 74 journalists had been killed worldwide, while 384 had been imprisoned during the course of their duty. Since January this year, 38 journalists, four citizen journalists and eight media assistants have been killed, with 183 journalists, 170 citizen journalists and 13 media assistants imprisoned. Additionally, according to Deutsche Welle, in 2015, 1,054 authors were attacked, imprisoned, tortured or killed. So what can we hope to achieve today in this parliament by holding this debate? At one level, nothing changes. We will leave this place in a little under an hour to go our separate ways. Some words will have been spoken and that is all. But on another level, much will have changed. Words, as imprisoned writers we remember today know well, have the power to do everything, to motivate and inspire, to reverberate and echo. That most basic of human characteristics, to use words to communicate and through words to create change. The words we speak today will be written and recorded, to be read and viewed by many in the days and weeks to come, to extend like a ripple in a pond, influencing behavior, making the simple yet powerful statement that words matter. The Day of the Imprisoned Writer has been held by Penn International since 1981 and it is marked by promoting literary culture, celebrating the freedom to write and taking action to call for justice and freedom for imprisoned and murdered colleagues. The intention of the day is to increase public awareness of persecuted writers in general and to draw attention to specific cases of individual writers and their circumstances. The general public is encouraged to take part in the form of donations and letters of appeal on behalf of the selected writers. We hope that the Scottish Parliament will recognise the Day of Imprisoned Writer as a focus for the campaign to free those we remember today and others. And we will hope that it will inspire many to take part in other activities, including Amnesty's letter writing campaigns and the work of Penn through the Writers at Risk Committee. Giving hope to those imprisoned for their beliefs and giving notice to their jailers that their plight is known and understood in places distant. 37-year-old Ashraf Fayad is an artist and poet of Palestinian origin. Ashraf is the son of refugees from Khan Yunus in the Gaza Strip. And while he lives in Saudi Arabia, he doesn't have Saudi citizenship. He has been active in the art scene in Saudi Arabia and has organized and curated exhibitions of Saudi art in Europe and Saudi Arabia. He was active in the British Arabian Arts Organization, Edge of Arabia. After an argument with a fellow artist at a soccer game, 
Fahad was detained by the country's religious police in 2013, released on bail, then rearrested and tried in early 2014. He was then sentenced to four years in prison and 800 lashes. On appeal, a Saudi appeal court returned the case to the lower court where a new judge was assigned to the case. In November 2015, Fahad was sentenced to death by beheading for apostasy. Used as evidence against him were several poems in his book, Instructions Within, Twitter posts and conversations he had in a coffee shop. Prior to this death sentence, Fahad was accused of having promoted atheism in the same book of Poems Within, which was published in 2008. He was also convicted of having images of women on his mobile phone. He did, but there was nothing salacious in the photos. There were fellow artists who were appearing at the Jeddah Art Fair. This led to an international outcry and organised protest. 128 readings of Fire's poetry took place worldwide in 47 countries, three of those events in Scotland. The sentence was commuted in February 2016, apparently because of the international protest, but the poet still faces a sentence of eight years in prison and 800 lashes and must also repent through an announcement in official media. Fire supporters believe he's been punished by hardliners for posting a video online showing a man being lashed in public by the religious priest, by the, the religious police. Adam Kugel, a Middle East researcher for Human Rights Watch, said Fire's death sentence showed Saudi Arabia's complete intolerance of anyone who may not share government-mandated religious, political and social views. Ashraf's father had a stroke when he learned his son was to be beheaded. He died a few months ago before the sentence was commuted. Ashraf was not allowed to attend the funeral. An extract, an extract from Ashraf Fayyad's disputed poems from Instructions Within, translated by Mona Kirin. Your mute, mute blood will not speak up as long as you pride yourself in death, as long as you keep announcing secretly you have put your soul at the hands of those who do not know much. For Ashraf Fayyad, for all the other writers we will remember today, for all of the other thousands who are imprisoned or at risk of being imprisoned around the world, and for the right of all to put pen to paper, we are proud to stand in solidarity with those around the world who have been persecuted for expressing themselves. We commemorate the day of the imprisoned writer and work to raise awareness of their plight and to secure their release. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McKee. And we move to the open debate of speeches around four minutes, please. And I call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I thank uh, Ivan McKee for bringing this debate to Parliament, and I welcome this debate, and it's an important debate to have. Free and open speech is a necessity of democracy, and all should be able to express their views to encourage further deba debate. Of course, there are debates that are unpleasant ones, but it is my belief that even the most unpleasant debates with the most unpleasant people must be had. For without debate, views that we deem repugnant, repulsive, regressive, go unchallenged. But these views must be challenged. Indeed, these are the most crucial views to hear so that we can challenge them. And that is the fundamental importance of free speech and why this debate is important to have. For in the UK, in Scotland, we live in a democracy and all of us here are well aware of the importance of debate and from all sides. In recent weeks, it's become clear that there are those who have attempted to interfere with debate. That is the attempt to seek fraction in our society and challenge our democracy. That is not right. We cannot allow others to dilute debate, to undermine arguments on both sides, and sow discord within the foundations of our political system. Likewise, we cannot imprison writers who add to strengthen that debate. These are not people who seek to fracture and destroy, but to encourage and challenge. Orhan Pumak, a Turkish Nobel Prize winning writer, was threatened with imprisonment when he said, one million Armenians and 30,000 Kurds were killed in these lands and no one but me dares talk about it. Pumak was referring to the Armenian genocide. Pumak should talk about this. We all should talk about this, this and it is important to do so. It's important to explore history and learn from the past. Pumak, however, was a writer that wasn't imprisoned. His trial was dropped after international pressure, although he was fined and asked to apologize for his remarks. The same is not true for others. At least 81 journalists are imprisoned in Turkey. And Turkey, for some time, has had the most journalists in its prisons out of any country in the world. 
The failed coup last July resulted in a crackdown on officials and journalists alike have been jailed, believed to be government antagonists. The situation in Turkey is precarious, to say the least, and indeed, no journalist nor anyone should be imprisoned unjustly. At the end of October this year, 48 journalists were put to trial in three different trials. Earlier this year, a Turkish court sentenced Wall Street Journal reporter Ailia Abarik to two years and one month in prison, declaring her guilty of engaging in terrorist propaganda in support of the PKK through one of her Wall Street Journal articles. However, the original article didn't include any praise for the group, but pro rather provided a balanced and objective view of urban warfare that had gripped areas of Turkey's predominantly Kurdish southeast at the time. This is the type of journalism we should encourage, not arrest its authors for producing. More examples un of unjust, unjust arrests are those of the 17 employees of the Kumyat, which is a Turkish newspaper, accused of being accomplices to terrorism. Reporters Without Borders argue the employers were put on trial because the paper is critical of the, Scot of the Turkish government. Huge questions hang over these arrests and it is a deep concern that these examples are becoming ever more common in Turkey. To close, Deputy Presiding Officer, free speech and freedom of speech is central to healthy democracies. It is highly concerning that cases of imprisoned journalists are ever growing. Debate is a good thing, a healthy thing, and that certainly should be encouraged everywhere in the world. And I thank Amnesty International and Penn for highlighting these injustices. I call Ruth McGuire to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank my colleague Ivan McKee for bringing an issue of such significance to the Chamber. I'm pleased to contribute to this debate on an issue of such fundamental importance, the right to freedom of expression, as we commemorate the day of the imprisoned writer. This is a time to reflect on how fortunate we are to live in a society where freedom is respected, cherished and defended by all parties and by each of our parliaments. It's also a time to remember that we should never take this for granted and that we must always be vigilant of any attempts to dilute this fundamental right. Most importantly though, the day of the imprisoned writer is a time to reflect on those who do not yet even have that most basic human right of freedom of expression. Those who are still struggling and fighting for it. Those who are suffering unjust imprisonment, persecution and violence for the simple act of expressing their thoughts in writing. I'd like to join with colleagues in, in expressing my thanks to organizations such as Reporters Without Borders, Amnesty International, Penn International, the Committee to Protect Journalists and Human Rights Watch, who work tirelessly all year round to highlight the plight of imprisoned and persecuted writers and to campaign for a world where everyone has the fundamental right to freedom of expression. As we've heard, each year Penn highlights the cases of five persecuted writers that are em emblematic of the persecution and threats faced by writers and journalists across the world. One of this year's cases is that of Kurdish poet and artist Zera Dogan, who's currently imprisoned in Turkey. As co-convener of the CPG on Kurdistan and as someone with a long-standing interest in Kurdistan, I'd like to use my time to highlight her story in this chamber of the Scottish Parliament and to hopefully inspire more people to take action to help her. According to the Committee to Protect Journalists, Turkey has earned the accolade which holds no glory. It's the biggest jailer of journalists in the world. Zera's one of them. She's in prison primarily because of a painting that she drew and a news report that she wrote. The painting at issue is her recreation of a photograph taken by the Turkish military of the Kurdish town of Nuzebin following its destruction by Turkish forces who were fighting the PKK. For the Turkish army, it's a victorious photograph of their suppression of the town with destroyed buildings draped with Turkish flags and surrounded by tanks. For Zera and the residents of the town, by contrast, it was a picture of suffering and displacement. To reflect this, Zera adapted the photograph by painting the army tanks as huge, grotesque creatures consuming innocent civilians. However, although the Turkish flags were present in the original photograph, Zera was found guilty of painting the Turkish flags on the destroyed buildings 
and the painting was condemned as anti-Turkish propaganda. To quote Zaire herself, they gave me a prison penalty for taking the photo of destroyed houses and putting Turkish flags on them. But it wasn't me who did that, it was them, I just painted it. The second reason for her imprisonment, a news report that she wrote, featured a quote from a child who was affected by the clashes in the town. The child said, we're hearing gunfire right now. When the shots intensify, we run to our homes. When the tanks go away, we take to the street to protest. I think we're right. I know our voices will be heard one day. Zera's reporting of these five sentences was also deemed terrorist propaganda. Zera was first sent to prison in July 2016 and released in December of the same year. In June of this year, she was arrested again and is in prison as we speak. The actions of the Turkish authorities are condemnable and disgraceful. Zera is an inspirational and highly skilled painter and journalist, not a criminal. And I add my voice to the global calls for her immediate and unconditional release. It's one thing to talk uh, and quite another to take action. And I hope um, that in conclusion, I can persuade everyone to take action today and perhaps do what I did earlier this week, write to the Turkish Prime Minister and the Minister of Justice to press for her immediate release. The addresses can be found on the PEN website. You can send a short postcard to her personally. The prison only accepts letters in Turkish, but fortunate, fortunately PEN have provided a model letter that you can copy. Translated, the letter reads simply and powerfully. Zera, you are not alone. We are proud of your work and celebrate your courage. Your voice is heard around the world and we will keep advocating for your freedom. In that spirit, let's commit to using our own precious freedom of expression to support those still fighting for it. I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Thank you, presiding officer. And can I begin by declaring an interest as a, a member of Amnesty International? And like others, I'd like to thank the various organizations that have provided briefings and information and continue to campaign on this. Um, I think this is an important campaign that, that, that Penn uh, organized because fundamentally this is about democracy and democracy is precious. It's important, but it's also fragile and needs looking after because democracy isn't just about voting. It's not just about casting ballots. It requires rule of law, it requires freedom of association, and it perhaps most importantly requires freedom of speech and expression. Something that we almost take for granted on a daily basis in here, but something in many parts of the world, for many people, is something they simply do not have, and something that they find themselves persecuted or indeed imprisoned because of. And press freedom is a very important, a critical element of that, because it's through the press that we hold that mirror to power, that we, we challenge power and authority, that we can highlight its mistakes, its errors, its, and indeed its injustices. Um, as Ivan McKee set out in his opening remarks, today is a day for highlighting those who have suffered because of these repressions. And I would like to uh, uh, highlight the story of Oleg Stensov, a Ukrainian filmmaker imprisoned in Russia. He was uh, arrested on the 10th of May 2014 and subjected to a brutal three-hour ordeal involving beatings, suffocation and threatened sexual assault, something that's unimaginable to most of us in here. He was charged with the establishment of a terrorist group, politically motivated arson. And, and, and finally, the, and the bit that I almost had to reread again, conspiring to blow up a statue of Lenin. This was in 2014. This isn't something that happened in Soviet Russia. This is something happening in 21st century Russia. And because of these, he was, sub he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. He was refused extradition because Russia claims he had become a Russian citizen after the annexation of Crimea. Key prosecution witnesses have re retracted their statements saying that it was uh, extracted under torture. It's been added to a list of uh, terrorists and all clearly because of, uh, as Penn states, his opposition to Russia's annexation of Crimea. And that's the reality of Putin's Russia. Journalists are imprisoned, but they are also killed. Just this year, two journalists have been killed in Russia. Nikolai Andushenko, co-founder of the Novi Peterberg and reporter on uh, corruption and human rights abuses, was beaten and died from his injuries in April this year. And Dmitry Popkov, co-founder of the and uh, chief editor of Ton M in Minumun, uh, Min, excuse me, my Russian's not up to scratch. Uh, 
uh, but was reported of corruption and found dead in May 2017. In, in total, 25 journalists have lost their life since Putin came to power. And indeed, as others have rightly pointed out, the Committee to Protect Journalists say that we are now at a 30-year high, primarily because of what's happening in Turkey, of journalists being imprisoned. So this is the context of this debate. It's these freedoms that we have to speak up, these people who we have to speak on behalf of. But I think we also need to reflect on the actions of the Russian state, because it isn't confined to their own borders. They're actively seeking to to undermine democracy in other parts of the world. They have active propaganda factories, whether it's Twitter factories, through to their official outlets in this country, Russia Today, which has been condemned on several occasions by Ofcom. So I would say gently to colleagues, let's think twice about legitimizing those outlets. Let's refuse to appear on Russia Today, and certainly let's not take their money, because we must stand up for press freedom. We cannot legitimize the actions of the Russian state. Thank you. I call Andy Whiteman to be followed by Gillian Martin. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. Can I first declare, as a writer, an interest as a member of Scottish PEN and uh, thank Ivan McKee for bringing this debate. Um, as members know, PEN International's uh, Day of the Imprisoned Writer started in 1981 to highlight journalists who have been persecuted for pursuing their uh, craft. Now, the written word uh, speaks to the human story in all its complexity, uh, from personal inner thoughts to historiography and politics through to investigative journalism, journalism and activism. And writers, uh, as we've heard, are a particular target for oppressive regimes and powerful interests because the written word can, particularly in the modern era, be spread far uh, and wide. And words are powerful tools in the hands of anyone, which is why in an oppressive regime, authorities frequently attempt to silence writers who, frequently, uh, who, who write freely or who critique uh, their regime. And so it was with Anna Politkovskaya. She was born in New York in 1958 to Ukrainian parents who were UN diplomats. She started her journalistic career at Izvestia, a Russian broadsheet newspaper in 1982, as the editor of the Accidents and Emergencies section. From 94 to 99, she worked as assistant, assistant chief editor at Abshaya Gazeta, where she frequently wrote about social problems, including problems facing refugees. From 99 to 2006, and I wrote columns for the bi-weekly Novaya Gazeta, where by her own admission she became obsessed with exposing the killings, torture and beatings of civilians by Russian soldiers uh, in Chechnya. She wrote at that time also in an essay the editors that the newspaper would receive, and I quote, visitors every day in our editorial office who have nowhere else to bring their troubles because the Kremlin finds their stories off message so that the only place they can be aired is in our newspaper. She was, as a consequence of work, highly critical of Vladimir Putin. She won numerous awards, but as she gained prominence abroad, she was increasingly marginalized at home. Despite being a US citizen and holding a US passport, as an adult, she spent no more than a few weeks outside Russia. Her life was threatened on multiple occasions, and she was murdered in the lift to her Moscow flat on the 7th of October, 2006, having been shot four times at point blank range. After trials in 2008, 2012, and 2014, five men were convicted with Anna's murder, but those who ordered it have never been brought to justice, and it's likely they never will. In Anna's own words, I am a pariah. You don't get used to this, but you learn to live with it. Some time ago, Vladislav Surkov, Putin's deputy, deputy chief of staff, explained there were incorrigible enemies who simply needed to be cleansed from the political arena. So they, try, so they are trying to cleanse it of me and others like me. She continued, Chechen leader Ramzan Kadyrov has publicly vowed to murder me. He said during a meeting of his government that he'd had enough and that Politkovskaya was a condemned woman. I was told about it by members of the government. Why has Kadyrov vowed to kill me? I once interviewed him and printed the interview just as he gave it, complete with all his characteristic moronic stupidity, ignorance and satanic inclinations. He was sure I would completely rewrite the interview and present him as an intelligent and honorable man. That is, after all, how the majority of journalists behave now, those who are on, quote, our side. Presiding officer, I welcome this opportunity to put on the official record of the Scottish Parliament the testimony of one among far too many of the writers imprisoned for their beliefs across the world. As presiding officer and members know, we enjoy under Section 41 of the Scotland Act 1998 absolute privilege in relation to the law of defamation. This is an important liberty for parliamentarians to enjoy. All writers should be free to speak openly and freely without fear of persecution. 
and I agree with Ivan McKee's suggestion that Parliament should consider recognising every year the day of the imprisoned writer. I call Gillian Martin to be followed by Tavish Scott. Thank you, President Officer. I want to thank my friend and colleague Ivan McKee for bringing this important debate to the Chamber. The list of writers we know are imprisoned in order to silence them is distressing, and freedom of speech is a human right. This is a day where we draw attention to those who need us to be their voices, and I commend my colleagues for telling the stories of those who cannot speak for themselves. And I apologise for departing from doing that ever so slightly because I want to talk about someone who was imprisoned and is now free. And the reason I do that is because it's very close to home and shows that even in the European Union, writers' voices can be silenced for political reasons and we must always be vigilant and condemn it when it happens. At the time of his arrest in February 2003, Marcello Otamendi was a reporter of the Basque language newspaper in Egun Kiria the only daily newspaper published entirely in Basque language at that time. Egun Kiria had a very strong anti-ETA uh, editorial stance, but the Spanish authorities falsely claimed that Egun Kiria was financed by ETA and the stance was a smokescreen. After the paper published a feature which included some interviews from members of ETA, amongst others, the authorities used this as an excuse to close the paper down and the journalists were put into custody. Under Spanish anti-terrorist legislation, prisoners may be held in custody for up to five days without having to be told why. Otamendi and nine other members of the Agun Carilla team were held under these terms. I, I met Marcello Otamendi around two years ago when I was visiting the Basque Country on a speaking tour, and he's now the managing, managing editor of Beria, a Basque language newspaper. Otamendi told me that he was prevented from speaking or sleeping when he was in prison. He could not see his surroundings because his head and face were covered by guards. He was threatened with sexual abuse. And on one occasion, a pistol was held against his head and he was forced to perform a sexual act. Following a visit from a forensic specialist to check his condition after a period of torture, he was told by the Garda Civil that if he told the truth about the torture, he would be killed. He was also pressured into giving a false confession. The, the Guardia Civil had told him that members of ETA who were already detained had confessed that Egun Carilla was financed by them and that he would have no choice but to confess. Of course, none of this was true. Basque detain detainees are often taken directly to Madrid where they are arrested and the purpose of this, firstly, is it prevents them from being tried by sympathetic Basque judges. And secondly, it ensures that detainees' complaints about their treatment are only lodged in Madrid and they are likely to, unlikely to win. The Spanish judge allocated to Otamendi's case did not believe that he was tortured and closed the case without calling him to testify. Of the ten originally arrested, five members of the Egun Carilla editorial board members were indicted in charges of being ETA members. They were released on bail awaiting trial. They would need to wait seven years for that trial, enough time to kill their newspaper, which could not be restarted under bail conditions. In 2010, the final and unanimous court verdict stated that there were no grounds to have the newspaper closed. The court noted that the newspaper's closure was, and I quote, in interference with press freedom. And the judge declared, the allegations have not proven that the defendants have the slightest relation with ETA. And this determines in itself the acquittal with all pronouncements favourable to the defendants. No one has ever accepted responsibility for shutting down the newspaper without justification. And those who were tortured, including Marcello Otamendi, have never had any justice for those crimes. This happened in the EU only a few years ago. Human rights abuses and the silencing of journalists does not just happen in totalitarian regimes. It happens uncomfortably close to home in elected democracies, and we must always be vigilant that it does not happen in our watch. I call Tavish Scott to be followed by Peter Chapman. 
Starting off, so one of the uh, uh, challenges of a debate like this is that the case study that uh, might have been raised uh, by an individual member has already been uh, uh, spoken about, and I won't repeat the uh, striking uh, writer's experience that uh, someone else has already described in, this, uh, con in a contribution earlier uh, this afternoon. Uh, other than to say that uh, I'm with Ruth McGuire on this. It's actually uh, what we can do about uh, these circumstances. And I've got a couple of suggestions uh, for the Cabinet Secretary uh, on that. Uh, we meet delegations. Uh, there are ambassadors in this place, regularly up in the VIP gallery uh, in this chamber. Uh, parliamentarians go on cross-party visits frequently from here. Uh, and the consular corps are regulars, uh, regular attendees at parliamentary events. Many of them are good friends of ours across all of the political uh, parties. Uh, but I do not think that we systematically look at the kind of issue that Ian McKee has rightly raised in Parliament today and say, what is the cross-party work we could do on behalf of an individual, a writer, a journalist, who is being uh, held in prison or worse uh, in one part of the world uh, or another, and ask for some coordinated work to be taken forward, uh, both by our government and indeed by our Parliament as well, uh, in a way that could actually make a difference. So I'm with Ian McKee in terms of his suggestion of having an annual event or an annual debate on this, but I'm more than that, I'd like to see us uh, on that cross-party basis taking uh, such a case and actually seeing what we could practically do about it. I can't be the only one, Daniel Johnson mentioned it, who's had Amnesty International magazines sitting around my home when I was a child from a young age and being uh, encouraged uh, but during modern studies classes at school to write letters, in those days it they were letters, um, uh, to uh, one oppressive regime around the world after another on behalf of a journalist or someone else being held in the most abject circumstances imaginable, actually in circumstances that we can't even imagine. Uh, you can watch the movies you like but uh, the psychology of imprisonment, the psychology of torture, the psychology of what is done to individuals uh, is not uh, really possible to understand, uh, I suspect, unless uh, you can talk to someone who has been through that. So this is an important debate, and as others have said, Scottish Pen and Amnesty International and the other organisations that have rightly been praised uh, today for their work uh, should be and should be uh, again and again. Uh, but I think we should just reflect on, and I, I'm just going to finish with this, reflect on one other aspect to these kind of debates. Um, there is much good in this country across the regions and nations of the United Kingdom. There are some fundamental values that we share in our country, no matter where we come from in this a group of places that we all uh, inhabit. And therefore, when uh, the United Kingdom loses its judge, uh, a judge that we've had for a long time on the International Court of Justice, and therefore loses standing in the world, I think we should be deeply concerned about that for our long-term future. It doesn't matter where you are on the constitutional issue or, or all the rest of it, but just on the sheer principle uh, of uh, the UK and its constituent nations and regions playing a massively important role because of the values that we uh, suggest and hold dear to us in that kind of forum, I think is important. And I think to brush that off, as some have done in other places in recent days, I think is a, is a great failure of, of uh, our diplomacy around the world, which sure has had lots of faults, but also has lots of, of positive aspects as well. So these organizations, Scottish Pen and Amnesty International, and and uh, champions on their behalf, such as Ivan McKee here today, are to be congratulated for making this kind of debate happen. But um, I'm going to adopt what I'm now going to call the Maguire Doctrine, which is we need to do an awful lot more than just talk about it. Uh, before I call Mr Chapman, um, there's uh, a number of speakers who still wish, sorry, wish to speak in this debate. Uh, I'm therefore accepted. Excuse me. I'll start again with that because I... I'm feeling quite emotional at, at this debate, so excuse me. Due to the number of members who wish to speak in this debate, I'm minded to accept a motion without notice. That's under Rule 8.14.3, and it would extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. Can I invite Ivan McKee to move a motion without notice? Moved. The question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? That is agreed, and I would have dared you to do otherwise, I have to say. <laughs> I therefore now call Peter Chapman to be followed by Sandra White. Yeah, thank you, De Deputy Presiding Officer. And I thank I Ivan McKee for the chance to take part in this important debate today. But today's debate gives me also an, an opportunity to mention some of the great poets, playwrights, essayists and novelists that Scotland has to offer. You know, in poetry, we have some of the greats, Robert Burns, of course, something of, an, of a, a rebel himself, 
But near the home, we have Caroline Duffy, the first female poet laureate. And of never forget some of our great Doric poets, such as Flora Gary, John M. Kay, and J.C. Mill, who are some of my favorites, as you might imagine. The modern author, Ali Smith, uses her voice to express LGBT issues, rejecting gender stereotypes and exploring modern, modern ideas of relationships in her novel, How to Be Both. And Denise Mina has tackle, tackled topics like mental health, abuse, and addiction in her crime novels. It is, in her crime novels. It is vitally important that our authors continue to represent these ideas in popular culture and continue to push the boundaries. I must acknowledge that this worldwide recognition of these writers is not only down to our great pool of talent, but that here in the UK, these artists have the freedom to express their ideas and have them heard, discussed and appreciated. Elsewhere in the world, some writers are not afforded this opportunity. Penn International is an association representing writers, journalists, and poets, promoting literature and defending freedom of expression. Each year, a variety of cases are brought to light by Penn to recognize and support writers who have resisted repression of their most basic human right, freedom of expression. From 2006 to 2017, the Day of the Imprisoned Writer has recognized and paid tribute to over 50 writers who, have, who are either in prison or had lost their life for their work. And while reading these cases, one which stood out to me in particular for its severity was that of Susana Chavez Castillo. Susana Chavez was a prominent poet and women's rights advocate in her hometown of Ciudad Juarez and had received recognition and accolades throughout Mexico, Mexico for her work. The phenomenon of female homicides in Ciudad Juarez had resulted in an estimated 370 women being killed between 1993 and 2007. And very few suspects of these killings were arrested or imprisoned due to suspected gang involvement. Susana Chavez stood up against this injustice. She was an active member in numerous organizations supporting women and the families and friends of those who had been murdered. In 2002, a social justice movement formed. They were called Ni Una Mas, a slogan Chavez is known to, for having coined and popularized in full, Ni Una Muerta Mas, meaning not one more death. This slogan began to be used at protests around her hometown. Chavez was known for being highly vocal in her fight for justice for women and often read her poetry dedicated to the murdered women at demonstrations. On the 6th of January 2011, Susanna left her home to meet some of her friends at a local bar. She never made it to her friends and she never made it home. She was found the following day strangled with a plastic bag over her head and one of her hands cut off with a saw. This abhorrent murder was followed by four more women writers in 2011. This case is just one of the many that Penn International have recognized. Its brutality is shocking, but this, this brutality is vital in bringing to light the importance of freedom of speech and the injustice that exists in other parts of the world. I acknowledge the work that Penn carries out in supporting those who face unjust imprisonment, attacks, harassment, and violence, simply for using free expression in their work. Thank you. Call Sandra White, to be followed by Ross Greer. Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer. And can I take this opportunity to thank yourself, presiding officer, for the work that uh, you've carried out in human rights issues. Uh, I know very well it's a, uh, an issue that's very close to your heart and still remains very close to your heart as well. We do thank you sincerely for the work that you've carried out in that. And can I also thank uh, Ivan McKee, obviously, uh, for securing this debate. I think it's a really important debate. And everyone who's spoken, I think it's been fantastic with all the different uh, people they have mentioned. And when Tavi Scott was talking about, obviously, being in a privileged position, particularly in the CPA, 
the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, where we do get an opportunity to speak to people from these particular countries, uh, then I think we should use that opportunity to push uh, the rights for freedom of expression with the, the people we meet and obviously with the government also. I just I wanted to touch on two, if I've got time, uh, basically, which uh, I think deserve, you know, the, the, here to be heard in the Parliament. One is uh, I've met with the family is Raif, Raif Baidi from uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Darin Tatur from Palestine. If I could touch on that particular, he's both uh, imprisoned for um, persecuted as well uh, for uh, expressing themselves. I think Raf's um, story, I think, is pretty well known. Uh, he was sentenced to 10 years in prison, 1,000 lashes for setting up a website which championed free speech in his blog, and the Saudi Free Liberals Forum was shut down in 2012. Uh, Raf has already served half of his prison term. However, even after he is released, he still faces a further 10 years separated from his family and his three children uh, who I've met here in Edinburgh and also in, in Glasgow as well uh, due to the travel uh, ban that's been imposed by the Saudi Arabian government. And uh, I was really inspired when I met with uh, Raf's wife, uh, inspired by her absolute dignity and her determination. And if I could just read some of the letter which she wrote on the Ralph Bowdy Foundation for Freedom website. His wife's name is Ensav and she said, I'm writing this letter today to express how thankful we are in my family and for your continued support for Rife's cause. Unfortunately, he is not the only journalist in the world facing a punishment and Saudi Arabia is not the only country in the world where freedom of expression is not implemented. Many countries have got yet to implement the liberty of expression, thought, belief and opinion. My husband dared to talk and, as you may know, faces 1,000 lashes, five more years in prison and 10 years before leaving the country. I'm here today to tell you that the Foundation and I will keep on pursuing Raf's dream, which is to see a world where liberty of expression is not a privilege but a given right. As I said earlier on, I think the lady has such dignity and determination in that respect and I wish all the best to the Foundation and those who support him also. The second one, if I could just perhaps touch at the moment, is uh, Darin Tatur. Uh, prior to her arrest, Darin was 33 year old, uh, was a little known poet and photographer living in the outskirts of Nazareth. She herself admits that her works posted online were rarely viewed more than 20 to 30 times. Yet, in 11 October 2015, she was arrested at her home and charged with support for a terrorist organisation and several counts of incitement to violence. This came about in relation to a video which she posted on YouTube in which she recites her poem, Resist My People, Resist Them. The poem is set in music against a backdrop of Palestinian resistance of men throwing stones at the Israeli army. Darina spent several months in prison. At the moment, she is under house arrest and a curfew. And while she is able to go out, she can still not use the internet. Two very different types, but also people who are pushing forward their freedom of expression and basically wanting the world to know what is happening. So I thank all the organisations who have given us the opportunity and to continue to fight for freedom of expression throughout the world. Thank you very much, President Officer. The last of the open debate speakers is Ross Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Like colleagues, I'd like to thank Ivan McKee for bringing the Day of the Imprisoned Writer to Parliament. Um, it seems almost fashionable today to bash the media as a monolithic, corrupt and deceitful force, to see journalists as opponents of whichever cause you're aligned to. This trend is irresponsible, and it's one that we as elected representatives have a role in standing against. It's not good enough for us to simply resist falling into the trap ourselves. We must actively speak out against it, particularly when it take, takes hold in movements that we as MSPs are leading members of. Skepticism, particularly of corporate media, is healthy, is legitimate. Many journalists do pursue political agendas as they have a right to do. But journalism remains one of the most important and still one of the most dangerous jobs on earth. Journalists speak truth to power and hold it to account. Not every writer, of course, is a journalist, but as co-convener of the cross-party group on Kurdistan, like Ruth McGuire, I would like to highlight the oppression of journalists, particularly Kurdish and progressive journalists in Turkey. 
Like Ruth McGuire, I agree absolutely that it's more than just our words, but our actions that count here. Having spent a considerable amount of time with the Turkish consul, having written to him a number of times, advocating on behalf of um, imprisoned opposition activists in Turkey, including a friend of mine, I can say strongly to members that this level of activity does count. These governments do notice when we stand up on behalf of those that they're oppressing. In recent years, Turkey's end the earned the unenviable accolade of the world's most prolific jailer of journalists. Once held in high regard as an emerging secular democracy, Erdogan has dragged his country into the dark ages of oppression, human rights abuses, and the erosion of democratic freedoms. In one day of October last year, the Turkish government shut down 15 Kurdish media outlets. That brought the total to 168 outlets closed during the government's declared state of emergency last year. It's grown since. The suppression of Kurdish media in particular has reached the comical heights of closing a children's cartoon channel. Turkish state oppression is not contained to either the recent referendum on expanding the president's powers, widely regarded to have been rigged, uh, or the post-coup attempt state of emergency. On Tuesday of this week, Oguz Güven, an online editor from an opposition daily paper, was sentenced to over three years in prison for making terrorist propaganda. They relate to a tweet from the paper's account about the death of a state prosecutor in a traffic accident. The tweet was deleted within 55 seconds, but it will cost him more than three years of his life. And yesterday, Asenur Pardila, a former court reporter for another daily paper, which has been closed by the government, was sentenced to seven and a half years for being a member of an armed terrorist organization. She maintains her only crime was reporting on the notorious Turkish justice system. And she says that she, rejects, uh, she regrets having done so. She wishes that she'd never done it. That's exactly what Erdogan wants. They want not just to crush what little free press remains, but to create an environment where no one is able to step up and take the place of those who've been thrown in jail. The trial against Nazim Turfent, a reporter for the pro-Kurdish Dishul News Agency, resumed last week, despite all 17 prosecution witnesses having withdrawn their testimonies, telling the court that they testified under torture and threats from the police against a journalist that they did not know. During the first, the second, and the third hearings of the trial, 17, all 17 witnesses who submitted testimonies against her friend withdrew their statements, said they originally signed the testimonies because the police threatened them, and yet the trial continues. Today we stand in solidarity with Oguz, with Asenur, with Nadim, and with the many, many other jailed journalists, lawyers, politicians, opposition activists, and human rights defenders in Turkey. We tell them that they are not alone, and we tell the Turkish government that we are watching and that we demand an end to their oppression. I now call Fiona Hislop to respond to the debate. Uh, Presenting officer, uh, I'd like to thank Ivan McKee for raising this subject in debate today and all members for their very thoughtful contributions. Clearly there's a lot of support across the chamber uh, for the day of the imprisoned writer. Scottish Pen, Amnesty International and others have a crucial role to play in raising awareness of and showing solidarity with writers who face persecution for expressing themselves and I join other members in thanking them for their work. I also want to come to the central question of uh, freedom of expression shortly, but I would like to point out that, firstly, my belief uh, is that it is the job of government not just to promote freedom of expression, but to promote a broader culture that gives space for literature and writing to flourish. And I think this was a point that Daniel Johnson reflected on about the precious nature of democracy and of freedom. Tonight I'll speak at the Literature Alliance's Scotland's Literary Cabaret, which has been established to pay tribute to Scotland's publishing festivals, libraries, writers and international activities. It will be a celebratory event and a reminder of the richness in Scotland's writing talent. Today's debate is a telling reminder of how not all parts of the world are able to promote and draw on writing so freely. In Scotland we defend fiercely the right to say what we think. This is something we so often assume without thinking, but it is worth pointing out that this right is also established and protected in law, both internationally and in Scotland. Following World War II, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, described as a common standard of achievements for all peoples and all nations, set out fundamental human rights to be universally protected. And this included the right to freedom of opinion and expression. Since then, freedom of expression has been given practical effect in the International Covenant 
on civil and political rights in the European Convention on Human Rights. And of course, in Scotland, the Scotland Act 98 and the Human Rights Act 98 required that Scottish legislation, the acts of Scottish ministers and the actions of public authorities all comply with the rights contained in the European Convention. And we all have an obligation to respect the rights of others, perhaps especially the right to hold views with which we disagree. Pluralism in democracy is itself vital and is fundamental both to individual autonomy and to the health of our and indeed any society. And that is why the motion is right to support the importance of defending and supporting freedom of expression for every person. And Gillian Martin focused on freedom of expression, particularly of a Basque writer in her remarks. Last week in a speech in London, the UN Secretary General identified winning the battle of ideas as key in the fight against terrorism. He stated plainly that when we protect human rights, we are tackling the root causes of terrorism. And he spoke of the need to invest in inclusive societies where, diverse, where diversity is perceived as a richness, not a threat. And he urged political, religious and community leaders to fulfil their responsibilities in promoting a culture of tolerance and mutual respect. He underlined the importance of standing up for free media and the right to dissent promoting the rule of law, demanding accountability and justice, adding that the brave activists and civil society organisations that take on these issues are keeping us all safe. So the legal protections that we have in Scotland are essential, both in themselves and as statements of a commitment throughout society to uphold this essential feature of any modern democracy. And the day of the imprisoned writers reminds us that this is not the case in many parts of the world. Indeed, as noted by Reporters Without Borders in this year's World Press Freedom Index, there has been a significant decline in press freedom in nearly two-thirds of the 180 countries. Uh, Peter Chapman in particular referred to the situation in Mexico. And the highlighted case studies demonstrate that as well as journalists, poets, bloggers, novelists, artists and filmmakers in Africa, Asia, South America, Europe and the Middle East have suffered threats, attacks, imprisonment, and even been killed for their activities. I personally met uh, Ensef Badawi in May this year, whose husband, Rafe, uh, was referred to by Sandra White, and he's been sentenced to 10 years in prison and a thousand lashes for setting up a website that championed free speech in Saudi Arabia. In Russia, journalists who seek to uncover issues like corruption often face threats, violence, and harassment. 58 journalists have lost their lives in Russia since 1992. Andy Whiteman spoke on the Russian situation in particular. Since last year, Turkey has been the world's biggest jailer of journalists. And Ross Greer and Rachel Hamilton, Hamilton set out their concerns about Turkey uh, and, her, and, her, and their contributions. And Ruth McGuire set out one very personal case. In my last two, however, brief conversations with the Turkish ambassador and consul general, I have raised the systematic and general issue of imprisoned writers. Tavish Scott is right to urge members in this parliament to take responsibility, not just to debate, but also to act. The Istanbul 10, who were detained on the 5th of July while attending a workshop to discuss ways to continue their human rights work in Turkey's state of emergency, of course, is a matter of concern. After months of campaigning by the global amnesty movement on the 26th of October, the Istanbul 10 were released from jail on bail. How amnesty's Turkey's chair uh, Tana Kilic remains behind bars awaiting trial. When we consider such people, it is essential that we remember that they are being treated in this way uh, for doing something that we would consider to be normal, acceptable, and worthy of supporting and encouraging. So it's impossible to overstate the importance of standing with all those throughout the world who make personal sacrifices to defend and uphold human rights. An important part of, what is, of that is being uh, absolutely steadfast in defence of our own rights and freedoms. And beyond our borders, we remain determined to promote democracy, the rule of law and fundamental human rights. As we mark the day of the imprisoned writer and reflect on the individuals highlighted by Scottish Pen and others, our shared goal must be to stand with those who do suffer in this way and make it our ambition to do all that we can to ensure that freedom of expression is maintained throughout the world. As Ian McKee said, words matter, writers matter. And this parliament says that imprisoned writers matter to us and their creative minds matter. I'm sure that many of us in this chamber would agree and reflect with that uh, 
a reflection by Gandhi. You can chain me, you can torture me, you can even destroy this body, but you will never imprison my mind. Words matter, writers matter, imprisoned writers matter to us. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate and the meeting is suspended until 2.30pm.